Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Karen. So uh, today we're having a new session of this uh, seminars on the physics department at the University of Chile. And today we have uh, with us uh, Karen Daniels. For me, it's a real pleasure to, to come with her, her presence. Uh, we know uh, for some years already, we work in similar subjects. And um, Karen is going to talk us about grammar materials. Um, she, uh, I'm going to describe briefly her bio. Uh, she made a PhD in Cornell University, um, then uh, a, a postdoc on the Duke University. And then you were, uh, became professor at the North Carolina State University in 2005. And she does experiments on um, ground materials and disorder systems. Um, and among other things, she was visiting professor at the Max Planck Institute in Göttingen. And also she's associated with a uh, editor of Physical Review Letters, no? So um, she's going to talk us about uh, her research and the main features of grammar materials. Um, and although in our lab, there are many people that work on grammar materials, I asked her to make a broad in, uh, presentation for people working in, in all different subjects on physics. So please, Karen, is all yours, the presentation. Right. And thank you so much for inviting me. I mean, one of the and there's not been many upsides to the last year, but one of but one of them has been to be able to visit places that are very far, even though you can't travel there in person. And you know, I have met I think more people you know doing science around the globe this year, um, in spite of the distance. Um, and I will say that I will stick around at the end, and particularly students and postdocs. You know, you guys have been missing out on your conferences this year and meeting new people which is a huge part of making your way in science. And so if you wanna stick around at the end, I'll be happy to chat uh, for a bit. Um, yeah, so please interrupt during the talk if you have questions. I'd rather talk about what interests you and pause and answer questions. Um, I have a habit of speaking too fast. I work on this, I don't always win. Um, and that's one of the reasons I wanted to have the transcription is I know this can be a problem. <laughs> I get excited and then I talk too fast. Okay, so let me share my screen. And this should pop up. Excellent. So yeah, so this is a talk and I'm gonna sort of go from, you know, sort of the more practical side up to some fun stuff that has astronomical consequences these days. Um, and, you know, some mix of experiments and some of sort of the theoretical frameworks around them. And of course, you know, the folks who work um, with Rodrigo know that he is an expert uh, in lots and lots of these things. Um, and so there's a phrase in English to bring coals to Newcastle. Um, and I think that's a little bit like what I'm doing here. <laughs> All right, so these are, these are some pictures that sort of just inspire me and why I think that granular materials um, are an interesting thing to study. Um, so these are black eyed peas, um, which are sort of the local bean of North Carolina. Um, they came, they came with, the uh, slave trade from Africa, actually, and a huge folk food here. Um, these are a uh, set of, sand, of um, salt piles um, in the island of Bonaire in the Caribbean. And, you know, when you look at things like this, it's just remarkable how perfect the angle of repose is, right? So how repeatable things can be um, in spite of the fact um, that they're disordered. Um, another um, thing I love, and I first saw this picture um, when I was probably 14 in a geology textbook. Um, and this is an earthquake fault right along here. There was a giant earthquake in San Francisco in California, uh, actually caused a large part of the city to burn down. Uh, but what, what's remarkable here is that the fence survived intact, except that it was displaced by two meters. Um, and so this is sort of a, an interesting phenomenon where you know, the shear can be incredibly localized to very narrow distances, um, even though the disturbances perpendicular are tremendously powerful and large. Uh, 
These are pictures here is from Jordan, uh, Indiana Jones uh, hung out here um, in some of his movies uh, and you know how these sort of stripes and these patterns form in natural systems. Um, that's also true here uh, on the right. These are sort of um, ripples in sand that form underwater. Uh, and recently I've gotten thinking uh, about asteroids. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that at some point. And you know how it is that granular materials on extremely long length scales Right, can form themselves into structures, you know, either planetesimals, um, you know, or the planets themselves. And this is a special something special called a rubble pile asteroid, and it's basically a pile of rocks that is held together by gravity in space. All right, so I'm going to do now is actually a demo. <laughs> and this will, fingers crossed, worked fine. Tell me if it's not working so that I can fix things. <laughs> All right, so I'm moving over here. <laughs> Can you guys still hear me? Can I get a thumbs up? Yes. Yeah, okay. Excellent. So uh, I'm at home for the day. Uh, and what I have here is a paper towel tube, a small plastic cup, and sugar from my cabinet. And you guys are all going to have to vote, right? So is this what I'm doing here a solid? or a liquid, right? Now, obviously the sugar grains themselves are a solid. That's not what I'm talking about, right? I'm talking about uh, the granular material that I'm using to fill the gap between the paper towel tube and the cup, all right? And so, you know, all right, so you guys have to vote now, right? So, how do we tell this is a liquid or a solid, right? Well, it's a liquid, then when I pull this, this out, it comes out. And if you guys think it's a solid, then when I pick this up, the whole thing comes up. All right, so if we were in an auditorium, I'd make you guys vote with your hands up and I can't see everybody now, but um, everyone vote for themselves. <laughs> and, if, and if someone wants to be very brave and say they think they know which one it's gonna do, then speak up. Is it a solid or a liquid? Maybe both. Maybe both. Well, there's a, I'm going to make this binary. This is multiple choice. Either when I pick this up, the cup comes with it or it doesn't. Ah, it depends on how you prepare the thing. It depends on how I prepare it. You guys watched me, right? And so, all right, so I'm going to do it twice, actually. Okay, so the first time uh, I'm going to pretend that um, okay, it's a liquid, right? I can pull this right out, no problem. Okay, but it's actually possible I could have done the experiment slightly differently. I mean, I'll be a little bit faster about filling it up this time since I'm not chatting. Okay, so I'm filling it up the exact same way as before. And of course, you can see that I'm pouring the material, right? So it really does feel like a liquid in that sense, right? Because I'm actually pouring it, right? So maybe it wasn't such a surprise. And you know, maybe some of you were pretty sure that was going to happen. Okay. But in fact, I can actually switch the behavior. Right? And now it's a perfectly good solid, right? So by tapping it, I could turn it from a liquid into a solid. And it actually dropped the level here by a few percent, okay, not by very much. And it's actually quite hard to tell how much I dropped. You know, it's, it can be on the order of one or 2% this change, okay? And so I tapped it and I turned it into a solid, okay? It gets even more confusing because I can tap it some more and turn it back into a liquid, <laughs> okay? So this is a material that doesn't behave you know, anything like <laughs> materials we're used to about switching between liquids and solids, right? So there was no temperature involved there. I didn't heat it up or cool it down. The behavior was entirely dependent on the history, as was already said, of how I treated the material, okay? Um, so let me go back to sharing my presentation again. Okay. Um, and I just, I can, Okay. And what we discovered was that 
you know, it's going to behave either way, depending on the history of how you treat it. And that's largely, this question is going to be at the focus of most of my talk and why this distinction is interesting and troubling um, and a challenge to solve. Okay. So, um, you know, this is a, uh, cover of Physics Today, which is published by the American Physical Society in the US. And this, this cover came out uh, actually before I was working on granular materials um, and actually shows a phenomenon that sort of highlights this weird boundary between solid and liquid really well, I think. And that is that if you, if you were to zoom in on the grains being poured, okay, what you'd see is that the motion is only happening at this upper surface, right? These are actually mustard seeds um, that are being photographed, right? And so you have this sharp boundary between solid-like behavior and liquid-like behavior, okay, that's very different than an ordinary material. And this is this, this, this localization of flow is the same thing that was at work in that earthquake picture, right? So this is a, something that happens a lot in granular materials. You have things behaving like a liquid, very close to things behaving like a solid. Um, here's a slightly more modern version of that picture um, from um, Yuel Forter and Olivier Poulikin's uh, review article. Um, where they shone a light so you could actually, with the shutter open, um, so you could actually see the bright reflection spot on the shiny balls, to, you know, sort of see the collisional flow uh, in the, the gas region, sort of correlated flow uh, in the liquid region, and sort of a crystalline solid-like behavior uh, down here, right? And so again, here's this is three-phase coexistence. All of these can be happening um, spatially quite close to each other. Um, so in my group, a lot of what we do is spy inside of pictures like that, okay? And so what you're seeing here is a movie actually slowed down quite a bit. There's a clock up the upper left. Um, this, uh, there's a wheel at the bottom that's slowly increasing the force on the system. It's sh you're shearing the granular material. And we're using an imaging trick where we are examining um, small plastic disks um, through transmitted polarized light. Okay, and so every place that is bright is a place where there is force uh, on the disks. And so we can spy and see not only the dynamics of the grains, okay, but also the dynamics of the forces inside them um, that are resisting those forces. And in this case, going from a solid resistance to something that flowed. Okay, so you'll see a lot of pictures like this um, during the course of the talk. So the I wanna tell you how- yeah. Sorry, the experiment is a monolayer. It's a monolayer, yes, okay. okay. Yeah, it's a monolayer, and I'm going to tell you why right here. <laughs> so this material is not a real material in the sense that it's a flat monolayer of disks, okay? Um, and the reason we need it to be a monolayer of flat disks is the optical trick we're using. So we're shining a light from one side, okay? And that light is going through a left circular polarizer, okay? It then goes through one of the disks, through a right circular polarizer, and then to a digital camera. And so What's going on is if there's a low amount of force, this is almost zero force in this picture here on the left, okay, then the, the, no light can get both through the left circular polarizer and the right circular polarizer, so all of the disks look dark. Okay. As we increase the force on the disk, and that's the, the middle picture, okay, the stress on the disk, actually, these materials are what are called birefringent. Um, or photoelastic. And what that means is they rotate the polarization of light um, in relation to the amount of local stress within the disk, okay? And so what you're seeing now is there are places in the disk, okay, which have rotated the polarization of lights. So the left circularly polarized light gets rotated, okay, and then it can get through the right circular polarizer, okay? And so now it's bright there, okay? But if you push even harder, you can rotate too far, Okay, and then it can't get through again, and then it's dark again. Okay. And so what you see here is an optical trick that's non-invasive, okay, and lets us see not only the part, which particles are in contact with which other particles, but also what the contact force is um, at each of those contact points. Okay. And so this is a nice technique because it has some of the advantages of simulations that we can know everything about every particle, okay, um, while retaining being real materials and with real friction and real elasticity, um, even though we're restricted to working on two-dimensional experiments. So you'll see lots of pictures and there'll be different colors depending on what lighting scheme we use for different projects. Um, those have changed over time. But just remember that bright 
is more force and more fringes is even more force. Okay, so I've shown you some pictures of things behaving like solids uh, or liquids uh, or gases. Um, and we make this analogy to ordinary materials because we're physicists and we understand those phase transitions already. And we think we might be able to make progress um, using you know, tools that we've used in ordinary materials. But it's important to recall throughout all of our efforts is that these aren't ordinary materials, right? So if we, you're drawing you know, textbook type molecule pictures down here, right, of a solid, a liquid, uh, and a gas, right? Remember there are some caveats, right? We've seen that the forces are, are carried through the material in this really heterogeneous fashion. These are called force chains. Um, we've seen that the flows of liquids aren't quite right. They have the shear banding. Okay. And in fact, I'm not going to talk about this today. And you know, Rodrigo knows lots about this, and you should talk to him about it. Um, is if you drive it hard enough, you do see gas-like states. Okay. And they're not quite right either, right? They they require energy input to stay in motion, and you typically see clustering instabilities and interesting correlations and things like that. But broadly speaking, you still see these solid liquid gas-like states. And broadly speaking, what people tend uh, to notice is that. The more densely packed they are, the more they behave like a solid, uh, and the more loosely packed they are, the more they behave like a gas. Right, um, and you know this is something that is a good rule of thumb, but is not the only variable that matters. We'll see. It is a very good variable, actually, up in this gas regime. It gets a less good variable um, as you go down lower. As I mentioned before, just a one percent change was enough to shift across um, this boundary, uh, for instance. All right, so these force chains um, have some interesting properties. Um, so I showed you ones that were really disordered. Um, in fact, they carry information. Um, and it's been known for a while um, that if you compress a granular material, um, they don't share forces uh, fair and square, right? Um, so um, a classic paper on this um, is from the Chicago group, and this is a histogram. I will show lots of these during the course of the talk. Um, often they're going to have something like force along one axis and how likely it is that you observe that force on the vertical axis. Um, in this case, it's a log scale. And people often talk about the fact that this might be an exponential decay here. That's not perfectly true. Um, but it definitely is something where you see a very broad range of forces varying quite a bit in how common they are. And so the strongest forces are actually a thousand times rarer than the average force, which is one here. And what you can see here in these images is the bright um, particles are actually quite rare. Okay. And you also can see that they, the patterns of those forces are very different depending on the history of how you treated the material. And so this is from Bob Berenger's group. Um, this is work that Trish Majmadar did when I was, he was a grad student when I was a postdoc there. And these pictures are just such a striking example of how different the force transmission is under different boundary conditions. Okay, so the, the, again, the particles know the history of how they've been treated. Okay. And these really aren't just about granular materials. You know, as people dig in and look at disordered materials, um, you know, that are you know materials that are composed of say emulsions. You know, so think like mayonnaise here. You know, bubbles, right? You again, if you go through and you start measuring the forces, okay, you start to see these long uh, chain-like uh, areas of high force. Okay, so this is a frictionless system that's very soft and squishy, and it sees them. Um, Itai Cohen's group has seen them um, in colloids, and these are actually measured by collisions from Brownian motion. They're not a direct measurement. Okay, and they see these long correlations. Um, again, from Bob's group, there's been 3D experiments since we brought up the subject of 3D. These chains do exist in 3D. They have slightly different character. Um, they're not quite as long um, and chain-like. They tend to be shorter, okay, but they once again, again exist in these sort of chain-like correlations. So it seems to be a broad feature of any particulate material, not just granular materials. And this is a, actually a very, very old idea. Um, and so, you know, I, I like showing this even though I don't speak Latin, because I'm always surprised. Um, it's actually probably easier for you guys than for me. Um, but Newton had this idea back when he was writing the Principia that he was trying to understand how fluids um, got their viscosity. 
right? And so how motion and fluids propagates. And he points out that if you have five particles, A, B, C, D, E, in a line, at some point, in order to satisfy you know, force ballots, okay, which is the notion he brought us, okay, there's, there's no particle directly in front of E, and so the force has to split into two different paths. Okay. And so he was wrong about this being the origins of viscosity in ordinary liquids. Um, he didn't even actually even know that atoms and molecules existed at the time he was writing this, but he was dead on for what's going on in any of these particulate materials, okay, that you're going to quite generically see force chains okay, and correlations um, in order because things need to be, uh, you, when you push in one direction, it's going to transmit to the next particle in a line. Okay, so this is not surprising that we keep seeing these over and over. Okay. And we can go a little further with Newton's laws, right? So um, if we're going to try to understand, you know, physicists, we're reductionists, you know, we start with n equals three and we work our way up to n equals infinity, right? The thermodynamic limit in any case. Um, and so if we start with n equals three and, you know, we can imagine giving this to our introductory physics students, Right, the first thing we they would sit down to do is count how many equations and how many unknowns. Right, they would you know quickly be uh, annoyed to find that they had nine equations. So there's a two D system. Just again for ease, you have two uh, equations for force balance and one equation for torque balance, and there's three disks, so you have nine equations. Um, but you have in this particular picture, there's five contacts each of which have two force components, you have 10 unknowns, right? So there's not enough information to solve for all of the uh, vector forces at each of these disks, okay? And this plays back into this idea that we've already been talking about, right? That you need to know some more information. And it's that information is the history of the frictional contact. So if you imagine that I was assembling these three particles, if I slid the particle, blue particle, in from the left, or if I slid it in from the right, that would actually reverse the direction that friction was acting. Okay, so unless you know the history of how the system was assembled, okay, you're never going to be able to solve for all of these forces. Okay, and this is what makes me as a physicist want to use an approach of statistical physics and talk about the ensemble of possible solutions and not one particular solution and how likely one ensemble, one particular realization is versus another. So we'll come back to that um, a little bit later in more detail, but I wanna show you um, a movie that um, Jonathan Colmer, who was a postdoc in my group took, that was very much reflecting this sort of idea of an ensemble. So what you're seeing here now is a, is a more modern lighting scheme that we use, okay? Where we illuminate the particles in monochromatic red light, um, but we also illuminate them in polarized green light, and here it's bluish green, um, so that you can visualize both the particles and their forces simultaneously really easily. And I'm gonna play that one more time. Um, and this is a fake movie. It's actually a set of stills put together where Jonathan repeated the same experiment over and over. So he would assemble the packing by moving the top wall away ever so slightly, releasing the forces and then putting it back. And what you see is that it doesn't come back the same way every time. Tiny details in how you change the history of how it was assembled, okay, sensitive dependence on initial conditions lead to different outcomes. Okay, and so this is an ensemble of possible force configurations without changing which particles are adjacent to which other particles. And so this is what this is sort of a realization of a statistical ensemble. All right, so we've, I've hinted at that I want to sort of just go and do statistical mechanics and understand this the same as all the textbooks I bought and read uh, as a student. Um, and the warnings there are that, you know, grains are not just macroscopic molecules. There's a bunch of problems. So these systems are always dissipative, whether it's from friction or from collisions. Um, you can't really separate the micro scale and the macro scale. So here's the particle scale. Right? There's a force chain scale, there's a system scale, and there's sort of a continuum of all of these. They're not well separated from each other. Okay, Another way to think about this is these are extremely spatially and temporally um, heterogeneous. Okay, So it's very tough to take averages that you trust. Right, This, this is going to complicate the use of statistical mechanics. Um, another problem is that 
you don't, you want equations of state. You do not want history dependence. And we get that from frictional contact. Okay, so all of these are problems. And there's another really interesting one um, that I'd like to highlight, which is that be simply because the particles are large, right? So the, um, the ones that I'm taking pictures here of are about a centimeter across, um, which would mean if you were waiting around for one particle to rearrange past another, okay, using just thermal fluctuations on the order of the Boltzmann constant times temperature, okay, that number is 10 to the minus 12 of the gravitational potential energy to move a particle its own diameter. Okay, so these are essentially will never happen. Okay, so this is this notion is referred to as athermal because thermal fluctuations do not play a role in the dynamics of the system. Okay, and that's why in the movie I just showed you, we were opening and closing the box to generate an ensemble. Okay, so these are inherently non equilibrium for both the first reason um, and the last reason. Okay, um, and therefore you have we have to proceed with caution with any analogies we make to uh, statistical mechanics. Okay. Um, for those of you who haven't seen thermal fluctuations of particles, I'm going to just jump into it. This is a different project. This is not granular materials. This is the PhD work of Carlos Ortiz, um, who was working on colloids, right? So these are about um, one micron sized particles in a fluid bath. And I'm going to go, and you can see them diffusing around. And so he started off by using fluid to compress them against a wall. And then when he let the fluid flow go, you sort of see the solid melting away by diffusion. So, the, so thermal Brownian motion does exist, but only for very small particles, okay, not for large ones like most of our experiments. Okay. Um, all right, some problems with granular materials that come about because of this. Um, I don't know if you guys have you know, cereal dispensers at hotels that suffer this problem. This is our local grocery store where we can order, we can decide how many walnuts we want to buy, right, that whenever you try to flow one of these hoppers, they tend to get clogged up, okay? And uh, volunteer from the audience, what's everybody's solution to this problem when this happens? Um, to hit it. You hit it, right. <laughs> right, so, so one, um, that is in fact what people do in factories too, where they're transporting granular materials, is apparently large hoppers have large dents in them because when they get stuck, people whack them to get them flowing again. Okay, and that whacking might seem a little bit like temperature with vibrations. So we'll come back to that idea. But the very the, the fact that these get stuck is related to this lack of thermal fluctuations. Okay, um, the opposite also happens. Um, this is some work of former postdoc and grad student Ted Brzezinski and Ju Tang. Um, so this is a system that has about uh, 5,000 particles in it. Um, the center wheel is hooked up with a spring along the axle so that as you rotate it, it ramps up the torque. Okay, And what you see over and over again is it ramps up to some limit and then it suddenly yields. Okay, It ramps up to some limit and then it suddenly yields. And this is the opposite problem, right? that you can't get it to move continuously. It, it exhibits a stick slip motion. Okay, and this is what leads to earthquakes, right? So from an, you know, an engineering and a geotechnical and a geological perspective, you know, these materials sit, often sit right at this solid liquid-like boundary where it'll flip between being one and being the other quite easily. And so now I wanna to return to that movie that I showed you at the beginning, now that we know a little more, more about it. And so what I'm doing here is ramping up the force Okay, with that torsional spring on the boundary. And the material is resisting it. And what you're going to see is that the particles aren't moving, right? There was just a, a change in the forces here that didn't really involve many particles moving at all. Okay, and that will happen a little bit again. Okay, that the forces can rearrange themselves. Okay, here's one that's strengthening, right? Separate from an actual rearrangement event where the particles switch motion. Okay, so when grains restart their flow, okay, they often in that precursor phase are rearranging their forces, okay, and then eventually they switch to rearranging their particles. Okay, and that's something that we see over and over again. Okay. So when, if we're going to understand these materials, it's not enough to just follow where the particles are. We very much want to also be able to follow where the forces are. Okay, so, um, you know, I'm a physicist, but I, I live in the world. 
Um, and one of the things that I, I know is that, um, you know, anyone who's designing industrial mixing or transport systems knows that they fail at much higher rates than fluid systems. They have to run them below their design capacity and this all costs a lot of money, right? Um, if you look out into the natural world, things like erosion and earthquakes and rock or snow avalanches or this debris flow uh, that I have over here. I know you guys, this is a problem uh, in the Andes. Um, this is um, from the Rockies in the North America, right? But you know, the granular materials are powerful enough to move entire boulders downstream. And this is basically a most, there, there is some water in there, but it's a primarily granular flow. Um, and so all of this is really dangerous and expensive. Um, and if we had a better understanding about this boundary between solid and liquid, right, then we might be able to, you know, prevent some of these problems, okay? And so I'm really interested in saying, can I describe the state of a system so that I can make a good prediction about its future behavior, right? Whether that's in an engineering context, right? Or, you know, to design the correct power and you know, safety mechanisms or in a natural context to say, when can we warn people that they should be worried and clear out before this happens? Okay. And so I'm actually actively working with folks both um, from uh, industrial companies and people who um, work in geological settings um, so that we can try to apply some of the ideas that I'm talking about to real systems. And that it doesn't work terribly well always, um, but if we don't try, then we don't, then we don't make progress. Okay. so. Before we get deep into StatMech, I want to remind us of some stuff that we probably all know. Um, and again, I don't know what everyone's background here is in terms of what kind of physics you do. Um, and so this is sort of goes back to real basics in case you haven't seen StatMech in a while, right? And one of the things we really do understand um, is the ideal gas. Um, we know it has some state variables on um, pressure, volume, and temperature. It has an equation of state, right? And one of the things that I just found remarkable when I first learned this as an undergraduate, and it never ceases to amaze me, is that these two definitions of the temperature that we learn in our introductory thermal physics class, one of which is about the fluctuations of the velocities of the molecules, and the other which is about counting the number of possible ways we could have arranged them in the system, right, as a function of the energy of the system, that these two T's, these temperatures are, are literally the same thing, and they don't sound like they have anything to do with each other. Okay, and what I'm going to talk about today is some ideas that are borrowed from one, this idea that when we tap stuff or we vibrate things, right, that might set things flowing, okay, but separately, this notion down here, while way more abstract, okay, might be a really nice way moving forward, and I'll tell about some of our progress in using this second definition as well which I would say is much less popular than the first definition. Okay, and one of the reasons I like to think about this is that we know that temperature predicts which phase of matter you're in in ordinary systems, right? And so if we could learn to take something like a temperature of a granular material, this might help us decide, are we near one of these boundaries and we should be worried about things starting to flow or starting to jam? This, the other thing that it's sort of nice to think about is that temperature also tells us the viscosity of the material. And we have a very good um, theoretical understanding of that, right? Um, we can understand, you know, how heating up, um, you know, say honey causes it to be less viscous and then changes how it flows in a pipe, right? And so this is another sort of relationship that if we understood it better, right, would really help us to work on practical problems. Okay, so does any of this work for granular materials? And you guys, you know, um, have you, we've talked about this, all of these, right? We add to this list, you whack it, you hit it, right? But does it work to do any of these things to granular materials to get them to, to switch from a solid light state to a liquid light state? And do these granular temperatures provide some analogies for those? Okay, and again, I'm not gonna work on the granular gas state. I'm really gonna focus on this sort of solid liquid boundary because that's the one that is most, that's the one that I'm most interested in, okay. And there's this wonderful um, framework for thinking about this that now um, goes back more than uh, 20 years, almost 25 years um, by Andrea Liu and Sid Nagel, which was that 
you know, we could maybe organize our thoughts around this idea that what separates flowing from jam states, right? In ordinary materials, you heat them up and they start melting and they flow, okay? For these foams or granular materials or things like that, you can get them flowing either by making them less densely packed or load by pushing them harder, right? And any of these cases, you know, whichever those three axes we choose, you're gonna end up in a state where deformation is easier. Now this formal phase diagram turns out to really only make sense for systems that don't have friction, okay? I work on frictional granular materials. We shouldn't take this too literally, but it definitely helps us organize our thoughts and tell us at least which direction we should be moving um, in order to get into a, to cross this boundary between solid-like and liquid-like behavior. Okay, so how do we improve how a granular material floats? Okay, so could we make the system more thermal? Okay, so I'm gonna give three options here, right? So we said that the thermal energy KBT was too small to move things past a gravitational potential energy. So I can see a couple ways to fix this. One is to increase the temperature, okay? Uh, one is to reduce gravity. Um, and then the last one, which is that Brownian motion I just showed you, right, is to make the particles small enough Okay, that they actually vibrate. So that's that colloidal example at the bottom. Okay, so we already know option three works. Let's look at option one and option two. Okay, um, so the movie at the left is a movie taken during Kerry Nichols' PhD thesis in Leiden. And what you're seeing is Archimedes' effect, right? So there is a duck rising out of a bath of, bath of glass beads, and there is a heavyweight sinking. Okay, and all that she changed there was to introduce really tiny vibrations at the bottom of this bucket of beads. And that tiny vibrations were enough to cause this fluidization to happen. Okay. Um, the one on the right um, is a example that I've been playing with in my lab. I'm gonna play it again. Um, so these are actually small organisms um, called cheese mites from Tyrolycus cassi. And you can see that they individually wiggle. And as a result, this looks like sand, but it is not sand. It is little living organisms mixed with flour. Um, and they actually can flow, okay? So whether the, the vibrations are internal or external, you can use them to get things flowing again, okay? Um, and so, okay, just a short diversion to talk about what those cheese mites were and where I found them. So Rodrigo mentioned that I spent, um, a year at Max Planck Institute in Göttingen. And one of the things we did was go out to this place um, called Verschwitz in Germany, where they make this cheese. And the cheese is actually cured in a bath of mites plus flour plus the leavings of the mites. And so this fluid here, okay, if you poke your finger in, it actually will, will flow and, and heal the hole. And this is an ancient style of cheese preservation that actually works. And yes, we actually ate it. It was it was tasty, but actually not that interesting of a cheese, aside aside from the fact that it lives in a flowing granular material. So we've built a model of this in our lab, um, and this is the work of Malia Kendall, um, who was an undergraduate and is now studying biophysics. And um, this is sort of a, a snapshot of what she was working on. Is we introduced uh, actually a different organism, flower beetle. Um, these are the ones that infest your household uh, flower. And then we put the larvae into um, flower and then at different concentrations, say 5% larvae, 20% larvae, 35% larvae. And then look at how the an angle of repose um, relaxes or whether or not it can relax. So for instance, at 5% larvae, you can't really get a, a slope to relax. Okay, and past some minimum value, you, you see this relaxation. And if you plot the slope as a function of time, what you see is the more larvae you put in, the faster the slope moves. So it's like you've increased the, um, you've decreased the viscosity by increasing the local temperature. Okay, and so I've sort of drawn that as a, as a visual analog here. Okay. And so this is, is it, this is a way of introducing something temperature-like into a granular material and making it flow. So here's the other option. Um, we can go and reduce gravity. So this is uh, me and two students on a parabolic flight. This is actually our very first zero gravity parabola. And you can see that we were terrible at it. Okay, we got better. 
a couple more runs later, we actually lost access to our experiment there. We were so bad. Okay. And the reason we were running those experiments was that I've gotten interested in the idea of we're starting to exploit asteroids. Okay. Um, these are these rubble pile asteroids I talked about at the beginning. Um, and, you know, these are the sort of, you know, several um, soccer, so several football pitches across in length, maybe um, up to several kilometers. Okay, and they're basically just piles of rubble. And so Japan um, and the European Union and the US have now all sent, oops, now all sent expeditions to them. And they actually haven't always gone terribly well. Um, so, you know, uh, Philae, who's the one who landed on the comet, um, um, whose name is down here, it's long and I'm gonna not try to pronounce it. Um, so it bounced, right? And then was landed and never really succeeded. Um, when the US landed uh, on Bennu with OSIRIS-REx um, earlier this year, um, and we tried to interact with the surface, it was much fluffier than we thought. Um, and so we don't really know how these, how to interact with these objects, right? They're, they're very um, small, okay? And so just for yourself, guess how small the gravity is. Right. And you get a sense here that there's some drama going on. Right. So a typical asteroid is going to be 10 to the minus five, you know, 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus six. So this is what's known as microgravity times what we're used to on Earth. OK. And so anything that you do to interact with them, OK, particles will be ejected from the surface and not fall back down um, very quickly. OK. And they'll be very little resistance to motion. OK. And so we, on the um, experiments that um, you saw us not doing, because we lost contact with our experiment, we eventually got better. Um, we took data at um, Martian, um, lunar, and microgravity through, through these um, parabolic flights. Um, and then Jack Featherstone actually took the Earth ones on Earth. And we've been studying the stick slip behavior there. And just from these still images, you can see how different the force transmission is um, in these two samples, right? And that the Martian, um, gravity parabolas, we were seeing that the intruder got, you know, bent um, by the granular material. They were interacting very strongly. We saw a lot of stick slip behavior. This is just a graph of how many stick slip events we saw as a function of the probe speed. Whereas in the microgravity parabolas, they all sort of just slipped in easily with very little dependence uh, on the probe speed. Okay, so if we're going to start designing missions to explore asteroids and we want our um, you know, our robots that land there to be able to interact safely and effectively with the surface, then we need to understand how granular materials flow um, as a function of how much gravity um, is present. Okay. Can I make you a question, Karen? Yeah. So this means that the pilot was able to tune the, the parabolic effective gravity to those it, of the planets? Yeah, they do actually. So what basically yeah. what the pilot does is put the plane into free fall, yeah. right? <laughs> But a controlled amount of free fall, right? Mm -hmm. So if you imagine that if I just went up, you know, a mile in the sky and dropped me, I would fall at some rate, I would have zero gravity essentially, mm -hmm. right? And so what they're doing is actually having the plane fall away at some fraction of that. And so you're falling and the plane is falling with you. And so the pilot actually hand flies these. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but basically they put you and then they have to pick you back up and bring you back up again and they do it again. Um, so it's like a roller coaster ride. You're, you know, you're, you feel very heavy and then you feel very light. You feel very heavy and then you feel very light. Um, so it's a remarkable experience. Um, you also learn that once you push off accidentally from a wall, you will keep traveling mm -hmm. until you hit something else, like somebody else's experiment, and that the other experiment doesn't appreciate that. Um, it's a very peculiar experience. We have we have no intuition for what it's like to move up there. Even just after one day of flying, I got better. But um, it's not a surprise we have trouble engineering in that context either. Thank you. All right. So I mean, I actually need to check the time. Actually, I realize I don't. I can't see a clock on here. How am I doing for time? All right. I should probably finish up. Uh, okay. I will go speed up a little bit here through this last. A bit. Okay, so I had said that we wanted to obtain state variables so that we knew where we were. Okay, so I'm going to tell you some of the story about how we're starting to do that. Um, we can't use them to make predictions about future behavior yet, but we think we have found some state variables. 
Okay. Uh, and these are based on the pioneering ideas of Sam Edwards um, that was now uh, shockingly 30 years ago, more than 30 years ago. And you know, I wanted to remind you as I sort of I comment on the fact of just how perfectly triangular those piles of salt were, right? That often when we perform experiments on granular materials, they're very repeatable, right? Um, each iteration is different in its details, but there is some well-defined average. Okay, and so he had this idea that we could do a statistical mechanics of this, right? Um, and that we should try to do that. And his original idea was to count up the number of different ways that you could arrange a system as a function of how much volume you had. And he said, we can define a temperature-like quantity and he called it compactivity, okay? And instead of being DSDE, like in conventional um, statistical mechanics, that the currency here, okay, this idea that something that's fluffier has more freedom than something that's dense, okay? So the, the, the currency here should be volume and not energy. And something that has a small system volume has only one valid configuration, right? If you give it a little more volume, there are more valid configurations, right? And so you can calculate, so this has a higher temperature, okay? So this was his central idea. And I will say that I don't, I don't think this is the correct statistical mechanics. Um, many things were done since then. Um, so Sam Edwards was borrowing from Boltzmann Right, he's sort of doing this copy paste, right? Everything in his column matches the Boltzmann column if you swap um, energy for volume, okay? Um, what's clear is, is probably the right ensemble now is something called as a generalized Edwards ensemble where you actually keep track of the forces, right? And so I've shown you pictures where it wasn't that the particles moving around were important, it was how the forces inside those particles might be different, okay? And so, what you need to keep track of is the force moment tensor, okay? And this is basically the Cauchy stress tensor on a single particle scale, right? Um, you can coarse screen it to get back to the continuum if you want, okay? But if we say we're gonna count the number of possible configurations under a given um, stress state, right? Can we construct a temperature-like variable out of that? And can we construct statistical mechanics out of that? Okay, so just like, um, you know, the entropy in a Boltzmann system, we can write this down um, for this generalized Edwards ensemble, okay? Unfortunately, because the stress tense, the stress is a tensor, that means that each one of the elements, the components of that tensor has its own temperature-like variable goes with us. And you'll notice that we got rid of the one over here, right? Um, and so the convention here is to just, instead of talk about, is to call this number the angularity, it actually is the in, like an inverse temperature. Okay. And there should be some distribution like a Boltzmann distribution. There should be some distribution of those stresses okay, that you can measure that is a consequence of a temperature-like variable. Okay. And so we're going to examine whether or not this works. So I have a question about yeah. that. So, so for the entropy, for the definition of a sort of temperature is okay. But mm -hmm. what about to the second uh, thermodynamic law? So we have a sort of irreversibility or evolution. So we can use in that sense or not? Yeah, so that's, you have to actually have to go through and test every single one of those things now, <laughs> right? You have to actually say do, which parts of statistical mechanics should we be keeping and which should be throwing out. So I will say that this generalized Edwards ensemble has passed a zero flaw test. That's, um, actually, I don't have those slides in here, but if you have a subsystem within a bath, mm -hmm. temperature equilibrates, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, angericity equilibrates. So it passes that test, right? So it passes, the zeroth law, right? And you sort of have to, the energy doesn't make, really make any sense, right? So you have to, st but you say, all right, that's now the, the stresses, right? So how do you have to have force balance, right? So you can go through and construct analogs to each of those. And so I'm gonna point you towards this review article here where we sort of went through all the ways people have tested various things about this. Yeah, so you actually do exactly what you said. You need to deal with all of that, okay. Um, so I'm gonna tell you how we start calculating these things. So one is we take these pictures like I've shown you with this polarized light. We locate all the particles. We look at everybody's pattern of polarized light. From the patterns of polarized light, we can solve an inverse problem where we figure out what the vector contact forces are, right? Um, that's a nice computational physics that we do along the way. And so you can just take uh, the product. This is you know, the moment arm. This is why it's called the force moment temperature, um, moment tensor. You can actually calculate that. Okay, um, and if you do that, for every 
single particle. And in fact, we course screen over several particles. Um, you can calculate what the force moment tensor is in any region um, of your system. Okay. You can then change the boundary stresses, right? And you can do that again, right? And so you can count up by doing lots and lots of experiments how many times you've seen which stresses under you know, which conditions. Okay. And so this is tedious, but we have we built basically a robot that does it. Okay. Um, and so that robot experiment um, is what you've already seen some pictures of. So this is a much larger system than what I showed you before. There's about a thousand particles and it's got robot arms on the walls. And so it can, it can open them up. It can blow air jets across it to rearrange them and put them back. And you basically leave this running to collect lots and lots of data on the observed states. Okay, these ensembles of 2D packings. And so here's what one little piece of that looks like. So this is sitting on an air table, so they only interact with each other and not with the um, table. Okay, and so you can see that um, you know, the stresses will you know, propagate as, as you move it. Karen, can I ask you again? Yes. So you showed us before this, the example three particles where you have more unknowns than mm -hmm. uh, equations. How do you get rid of that problem here? So actually the, um, so we don't in the sense that the system, so one's a mathematical problem and one's a practical problem. So there really is a force at every one of these contacts, right? Whether or not I know it, mm -hmm. right? And so the system, and this is where it's nice that they're really experiments. The system really does pick some set of forces, right? Each time you do the experiment, right? We go and measure them, okay. right? So we just go and we go through and we say for this disc, what were these four forces? Okay. Right. And so we don't have an indeterminacy problem because we just measure them. Okay. Right. You're right that there's information there about whether or not torque and force balance are mm. violated or not. Okay. But on average, they're not. I mean, our algorithm is not perfect. Okay. Yeah. Um, so we can go through um, and do lots of experiments. And one of the nice things we can do is if we do enough experiments, we can collect them into bins. Right, so here's a bin where everybody in this bin had the same amount of free volume and was at the same uh, pressure, right? So this is the trace of the stress tensor, not precisely the pressure, but uh, right, so we can basically collect a population in each of these bins, okay? And where we have enough statistics, right? Because enough were assembled, we can start looking at histograms of those, okay? And so by binning them, you can actually separate the populations out into ones where you can actually start to calculate um, derivatives. Okay. And what's cool is that we don't know how to take a temperature here, right? We, um, we don't have a device for taking a temperature, but that histograms are themselves thermometers. Okay. And this is um, based on some theoretical work that happened uh, long before we did these experiments. But it's something that we don't think about is if you knew the hist, if you knew the probability distribution of any variable that you suspect is Boltzmann distributed, right? Um, and so here, sigma is our stress, and alpha is this angericity, this temperature-like variable, right? What we want is alpha, right? And what we have is a histogram, okay? So we want to test whether or not these have some dependence here, okay, that takes some functional form, okay? And it turns out the, whoops, um, that you can do that. And this, whoops, sorry about that. I am not going to actually go through how you do that here, but by clever taking of ratios, you can get rid of the prefactor and isolate the second part. And without going through all that math, I think we can observe from just looking at these that these look a lot like parabolas on a log linear scale, which suggests that this is like a Gaussian term here. Okay, it's not, so this tau is the shear component of the stress tensor, and it definitely looks like it's squared because these are symmetric. <laughs> Okay, so pretty clearly we're not getting something that looks like this. We're getting something else, okay. Um, so now we have to go back and I'm gonna bring Newton back one more time, right? So, and bring him back just in the guise of, again, introductory physics, which is that if I look at any one particle, right? Let everyone pause and think if they know the answer to this question, right? These five arrows, need to be in force balance, right? And I've made this friction less here just to make it easier. They're all normal, okay? But all, whatever is true here, even if it were a frictional particle, is that all five of these have to add up to zero, okay? So I can take those five arrows, the orange, 
arrow, the blue arrow, the green arrow, the brown arrow, and the yellow arrow, and they're going to come back to where I started. Okay, and so I can actually, this is what's called a Maxwell Cremona tile. So I can take force balance and convert it into a tiling for every particle um, in the system. Okay, and this is um, work that was developed by Bubul Chakraborty and Max B and Zilka Henkes, right? And so if you do, and it's a formal field theory, by the way, if anybody here cares about that. Okay, but just from a interrupting physics standpoint, we can convert this into a picture that tiles space. Okay, and as I squish the system from the boundaries, everybody still has to stay in force balance and torque balance, right? And so all I'm gonna do is be moving tile areas. I'm gonna be maybe enlarging the green tile and shrinking the red tile as I move through these things. So there's a conserved quantity, okay, which is the total area of these tiles given some set of boundary conditions. What's the area of something that is in a stress times stress space, right? That is stress squared, okay? And so this is some of the work of Brian uh, Tai um, and um, looked in looking at this in, in simulations, okay? And in fact, this is what you'd expect, okay? That whenever you have something where you have to satisfy force balance, you're gonna expect the stress squared to be a conserved quantity. So in fact, we did not see um, a nice Boltzmann-like distribution. We saw something, sorry, um, we did not see it to be linear. It was predicted we saw it to be squared, okay, because of this conservation, okay? And what this means is that this is sort of like an equation of state, okay? That if we calculate a temperature-like variable associated with this Boltzmann-like factor, in fact, it does not depend on whether we did biaxial experiments or unilaxial experiments or shear in one direction or shear in the other. There was a universal equation of state for this um, temperature-like variable versus this pressure-like variable. If we had done what we had predicted from the Edwards ensemble, which was to have this be a linear term, okay, then it was an equation of process. It, it was it depended on which um, type of stress, what the history was. So granular materials um, know their history in general, um, but if you look at the right conserved quantities, okay, like force balance uh, by Newton, then you can recover things that look like equations of state. Okay, and so that says that we might be on the road to understanding um, something here. Okay, all right. So um, I'm going to wind back up to the way of the beginning again, and remind us sort of why we got went down this strange path. Okay, is that we were trying to see which things I could borrow from ordinary statistical mechanics and which ones um, you know, might be useful for us, you know, making developments and understanding uh, dynamics. And again, it's in spite of all of these many caveats of why I should not have done everything I just told you. Right, so everything I just told you says that all five of these are a problem. Okay, and yet we saw some successes and we saw some things that carried over that are really encouraging. Okay, and so I want to just close by saying um, this is, you know, one of my favorite uh, uh, artists who writes uh, comics about science, um, Randall Monroe and XKCD, right? Physicists talk a big game about a theory of everything, uh, but the truth is we don't really understand why ice skates work, how sand flows, or where a static charge comes from when you rub your hair with a balloon. Um, and you know, if there's one of these little things that I can work on, then I'm really happy. Um, and so what I've shown you today is that this weird behavior near this solid liquid boundary has, um, has you know, angles of it that are weird because they are non-equilibrium, because they're susceptible to perturbations, and because they're collective in response. You can't move one particle without moving the other ones in their vicinity, right? Um, but I do think that making analogy statistical physics will give us uh, tools for understanding them. And I hope that that um, is something to, um, I've encouraged you, know, you guys to think about uh, as well, and certainly um, there's lots and lots of problems to be worked on uh, in this vicinity. And with that, I will shut. Thanks. Sorry, it's hard to keep track of time because the That's okay. screen, the screen yeah. hides my clock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Karen. So we uh, have time for questions. Um, I don't know if the questions from the audience. Uh, I, I have one. Uh, in your experiments where you change or produce many configurations of the same packing, uh, it seems that any, any way you didn't change too much the configurations in the sense that neighbors mm 
uh, tend to remain uh, being the same. I, I don't know if in this uh, theory of Sam Edwards, uh, you're doing something, uh, sampling of a pseudo ensemble, and if uh, things are going to give the same uh, ah, okay. answer. Those are, two, those are actually two different experiments. So the, the, the little one I showed you where we redid, that's actually not what we used for the Edwards ensemble tests. Okay. okay so those were actually completely different. Those were actually different experiments. They had different goals. So in the experiments I talked about at the end, in fact, we opened the box very wide and we swept giant air jets across to completely I... rearrange them before we reconfigured. Okay, so our goals there were to understand completely fresh ensembles. So we have the ability to completely rejuvenate and resample. Okay. Okay. There are and what happens then if you don't rejuvenate? If you don't, actually interesting things happen as well. <laughs> and so this is stuff that, so the, the goals of the first experiment um, the one with the little, where we were trying to not have them move, right? The goals there were to ask the question, can we predict which particles are going to have force chains on them and which ones won't? Because one of the weird things is there's some particles that always have a force chain and some that almost never do and some that are flaky, right? And so this was an experiment we were trying to understand how to predict, we actually can predict to some extent which particles will have force chains. Um, so very different goals in that experiment. More recently, we've been doing a variation on this experiment where we actually put it in a crystal because we got sick of them moving and not being able to put them back. So we actually use a crystal. The disorder in the force chains is significant, even though the crystal is, per, is looks like a crystal. And so that can be a convenient way where you can sample just the statistics of the force chains conditional on a particular configuration. Yeah, so we've done all of the above. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. This uh, one question of Marcel. Oh, yeah. So the majority of the results that you show are in 2D configuration. But I wonder that what happened in 3D if we have a new result or that we learn in 2D is enough to understand what happened in 3D? OK, yeah, so that's always a danger. So. Um, so there's a couple of key differences. So one that's known is that the, the force chains become much shorter in 3D. Mm -hmm. um, and people who are familiar with sort of, who thought about phase transitions a bit, um, which I don't know who in the audience that is, but you know, if you imagine, um, you know, if, if you're looking, if you're in a crowded room, which we are never now, right? But imagine you're in a crowded room because it's two years ago and you want to look for your friend, you look around in a circle, okay. right? If you're scuba diving and you lose your scuba diving buddy, it's actually quite difficult to find your, the person, right? Because there's a lot more places to look. And so that problem, so that, that shows up as a problem is that in granular packings, 3D can be quite different than 2D, right? And it's much tougher to find a particle in a line in a three-dimensional space, right? And so you don't, send to, you don't send to see these correlations, okay? So that's something that's very different. Um, exponents tend to change. Right, so very frequently the exponents of something you find will not be the same in 2D and 3D. Often parameter, often general things will be. Um, the thing I talked about at the end, nobody knows how to do it in 3D. Um, so this trick of tiling the space is not solved. Mm. It's not clear that it can be, because so, apparently if you, if you think about the problem of packing tetrahedra or something, right, it's a lot more likely you end up with gaps, right? And so it's not clear that this theory works in 3D. Um, however, from a someone doing simulations or experiment standpoint, we have no difficulty calculating the same quantities. It's just not clear if they mean the same thing. So that's completely open territory. Mm. <laughs> So I think this is a really good question. Yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, Nicolas. Uh, Hi, Nicola. <laughs> yeah, I have a question, a couple of questions. One is um how does this statistical mechanic framework work um for less dense granular systems like in a liquid or gas? I mean, you don't it's based basically on the on the force contacts. Right. So this does not work. So the, the what I just showed you is for this place where there's sustained contacts, right? And so as soon as you lose your sustained contacts, actually, um, 
you, you, you lost your whole theory, right? Because <laughs> the forces are zero, <laughs> um, which is not where you want to be, <laughs> right? <laughs> so well, how this is to predict something about uh, what you showed about the avalanches and these kind of events. Mm -hmm. So these are, so, I mean, so I would say, I mean, so my hope is that, so this, okay, so this theory only works right up until you lose forces, mm -hmm. right? My hope would be that it can tell you how close you are to that problem, okay. right? So where you are along this line, like this is the end where you need to worry. So can you find yourself along that line and say, oh, I'm getting close to the corner. Am I in danger of avalanching, right? As soon as I do, I've got a different set of theories to work with, <laughs> right? But that's not that that's true of ordinary statistical mass too. I have a theory of solid state physics that once I melt it, I have to stop using it, hmm. right? So I don't think that's necessarily a problem, right, yeah. right. right. Yeah, but it, but it is something that's weird about this particular theory that the quantity isn't even defined as soon as I lose contact forces. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Uh, I don't know are there some students who, who are brave enough to ask questions? I'd love to hear them. Yeah. <laughs> There's some students in the audience. Ah, ah, I recognize them. But... I promise I will not say your question is stupid. And I promise to trans get someone to translate it into English if you feel uncomfortable asking in English. Yes, um, I can translate also. But OK, there, there's no student question yet. But Maria Luisa uh, wants to ask a, a question. Maria Luisa. Yeah, hello. Um, very nice talk. I wanted to know if uh, with this technique of the birefringent um, optical uh, technique, uh, do you measure only normal forces? No, actually, or we get both. Measure? Yeah, we get both. Um, let me see. So let me get a picture here. Uh, where's a good one? You can see that this contact is pointed sort of diagonally. Yeah. Right? Oh, okay. So, so actually, the symmetry. Yeah, and so what this, I don't have a good slide for this, but it's it's 19th century physics, the loading pattern, the stress pattern for point loads is a piece of 19th century physics that have analytic solutions, right? So you, they can, those, and those force contact forces can have normal and tangential components. What we do is then we make guesses for what the forces are. We find it, and then we basically, we basically just run an optimization, like computer science style optimization, to keep moving the forces until we hone in on something that matches. And sometimes we fail, and we can't fit a disk. <laughs> and then we take, we borrow the forces from its neighbors and use those as guesses, and then try again. <laughs> yeah, but we can get the norm. We we think we can get the tangential forces. I will say that my confidence in the tangential forces is lower than my confidence in the normal forces. But yeah. We do get tangential forces. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Yes. Um, yeah. I would like to know if this uh, uh, approach based on statistical mechanics still works for granular, granular materials where the forces can like, break or even deform the, the particles and how would that change oh. if it still does work? <laughs> So, you know, that's a really good question. Of course, this is a crucial one for people working in civil engineering contexts. So uh, I don't know. Um, we have played around a little bit and we think this is true, um, that the particles that have the most force on them are the ones that are most likely to break. So we have actually been made some attempts. Um, so a collaborator in at Northwestern um, Giuseppe Buscanera is a civil engineer who squishes real rocks in a cell and does tomography to measure all the particles and then look at which ones break. And so um, Estelle Bertier, who was a postdoc on my group, has been working with one of his students to see if we can predict which, you know, is it the ones that look like they were going to have more forces that are then the ones that break? We don't know the answer to that question yet, but the theory of the statistical mechanics 
probably doesn't carry up to that point, but we have actually been trying to tackle it anyway. Thank you. So statistically, probably yes, we can make predictions about which places are more likely to break. Okay, thanks. There's one last question uh, uh, from Vicente Maldonado. I don't know if he wants to ask a question. Uh, I can read. Uh, if there's a research, uh, if there are some research on gravel materials moving inside a liquid. Yes, so these are sometimes called suspensions. Um, and they are incredibly interesting because part of the stresses are supported by the fluid and part are supported by the particles. Um, and the inertia of the fluid can actually change the dynamics of the particles. So, um, and many, many real flows are actually wet, either because of capillary bridges or because of fluid throughout. Um, the difficulty is that you actually have two things to keep track of. Um, and, the, and the main reason I don't work on them is that the, the photoelastic particles that I work with are not very chemically stable when you put them in a liquid. So it's not, uh, and so they're quite challenging to work on for me with my particular set of techniques. But that is a tremendously important area. Um, one of the nicest parts I think of it that makes a connection back to this is that Probably some, most of you are familiar with like uh, cornstarch and water can get, does this really cool trick where if you hit it very fast, um, you get a, um, it to be solid like almost instantaneously. Um, and so that phenomenon is now thought to be connected to these force chain like structures. So there's a lot to be learned by comparing the two. Um, but I haven't personally much worked on wet systems, but yeah, incredibly important. Okay, well, um, I think we are on time. Uh, so, uh, I, I, I know, Nicholas, you have some questions, but uh, let, let me uh, finish formally the, the seminar and then we can continue discussing with Karen uh, if she agrees. So, uh, I'm, I'm happy, happy to do so. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'll first thank uh, Karen for this very nice talk and presenting her, her experiments, very nice experiments, and all the audience here. So um, thank you, everybody. And we will upload the, the presentation in the YouTube and um, face, Facebook channels of the physics department. And we'll see you again next week, where we have another quite different subject of physics. So thanks for everybody. I'm going to stop recording.